Welcome to Among the Ferns, an Asylum Hill Community Access interview show. And now here's your host, Greg Hall. It's Hill. It would be great if we could get that re-recorded because this is the third week it ran that way. My guest today is Kion Wolf. She's a voice talent and producer at WNPR. Welcome to the show, Kion. Thanks, Greg. Hey, you've got some really great ferns here. This one's an Asplenium nidus osaka, the so-called bird's nest fern. You want to keep this one a little more moist than it is right now, but if you do, the undulated leaves here will look so fabulous. That's great. I don't really get involved with the plants. My first question to you, why is public radio so boring? The earliest fern fossils go back 360 million years. In Finnish mythology, if you find a seed from a flowering fern, it'll lead you to a place where a glowing will-o'-the-wisp guards a secret treasure. See, that's incredibly boring. How many times in the course of a year do you see Garrison Keillor shirtless? Whoa, I can see you've got a mule's foot fern over there. Careful with this bad boy. The fronds can grow 20 feet long. I think you have the wrong impression of this show. You're supposed to answer my inappropriate questions, not talk to me about ferns. How big a mirror does Kai Rizdahl have in his dressing room? Whoa, you are way out of bounds here, Mr. Hill. Kai is a cactus guy, not one fern in his whole office. I'd like to chat some more, but it's time for the nose. This week, President Obama's appearance on a comedy show would have been the video of the week if it weren't for a video about kissing. And now he plays the planet between Saturn and Neptune on the new Neil deGrasse Tyson show, Colin McEnroe. What planet is this? Mercury, Venus, and I, I can't count them up. All right. So, uh, yeah, we're doing the nose today. Uh, and with us making his debut uh, on the nose is Matt Warshower. He's a professor, professor of history at Connecticut State University, uh, board member in the uh, Connecticut Council of the Humanities. I practiced that introduction so much and I didn't, still didn't do it right. Uh, James Hanley is here with us from Trinity Cine Studio. Irene Papoulis, a uh, professor from Trinity College. Um, we are all a little breathless and excited because we've had so many videos to watch this week, starting with this unusual strategy taken by President Obama and his team. Uh, they were trying to reach a certain audience. They went on a, a video show, an online comedy show that, you know, I, probably 80 percent of Americans had never heard of. I'm making that number up. I don't really know. Uh, it's from the Funny or Die site and brand. Uh, it's called Between Two Firm, Ferns. It's hosted by Zach Galifianakis. Um, and well, actually, even before we begin the conversation, let's hear a little bit of how, excuse me, how that show sounded. You know what I would do if I were president, Mr. President? I would make same-sex divorce illegal, then see how bad they want it. I think that's why you're not president, and that's a good thing. You said if you had a son, you would not let him play football. What makes you think that he would want to play football? What if he was a nerd like you? Do you think a woman like Michelle would marry a nerd? Uh, Why don't you ask her whether she thinks I'm a nerd? Could I? No, I'm not going to let her near you. So do you go to any websites that are .coms or .nets, or do you mainly just stick with uh, .govs? No, actually, we uh, go to .govs. Have you heard of healthcare.gov? Here we go. Okay, let's get this out of the way. What did you come here to plug? So we know what he was coming here to plug. Um, so James Hanley, how did this work for Obama? There, as we will see in just a second, there's a lot of questions about who wins in an exchange like this. Uh, I'm not sure that's really the right way to look at it. But, but, but how did this work for him? Well, I think it worked very well in the sense I, – I mean I have my uh, – I, I don't think it was especially entertaining. But what was interesting was the exposure to me that, that it exposed the – president in a in a different way it obviously was an attempt to get attention in a different way and i think it worked for that and one of the remarkable things about um uh, about barack obama is that he's very he's a very smart guy but very often he's in situations where that doesn't really he doesn't get a chance to actually show that he could actually have a conversation albeit scripted obviously but i think that that, to me, created a different sort of sense of him. I was sort of pleased to see him doing that, even if it wasn't a sort of perfect situation. It, it, uh, 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 one of the things that particularly struck me was this thing of not knowing anything about it until it was pointed out to me. It was like these things that suddenly become viral, that suddenly change the conversation so quickly – it's the the incredible speed with which it rises and apparently built a lot of uh, it did it did its job it 
had yeah. a huge increase in the number of people going to the healthcare.gov site. So it succeeded on that level. But I thought it was just interesting about the guy, about, about um, uh, Barack Obama himself. It was an interesting thing to see to me. What were you gonna say? Yeah. Um, well, when you said uh, "albeit scripted," you know, I when I first saw it, I just saw it for a second. Someone posted it on Facebook or something, and I looked and I just sort of cringed. I just thought, "Oh my God, it's just so embarrassing." Obama's being so awkward, you know. And then my son said, "Oh, but it's totally all scripted." And I said, really? It just didn't, you know, I'm just naive about those kind of things. It just hadn't occurred to me. So when I went back and watched the whole video, thinking that the whole thing was scripted, I thought, wow, he's delivering those lines really well. He's doing a good job, you know. So yeah. I don't know that it seemed, I, I don't know, I, but it didn't seem as awkward the second time around for some reason for me. I want to get mad on this, but before I do, I want to give out the phone number, too. If you saw the video this week, if you had a reaction to it, uh, if, you, uh, if you and Fox News thought it was beneath the president's dignity, and we'll come to that in just a second, 860 <laughs> 275-7266. Matt, presidents have to do this all the time, though, right? They, FDR had to figure out that the radio and that the fireside chat uh, was going to be an incredibly effective tool to use, a tool that no president had ever used before. And it's more complicated with the current mediascape. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly the right uh, way to look at this is the context of it. And, and presidents, you know, as a presidential historian, uh, I, I look at it in this very broad sweeping context of how presidents and politicians have utilized the media to uh, greatest effect. I, I found the, the, the piece irreverent and hilarious. I thought it was so <laughs> funny. And then when I read the background uh, about it, you know, pre pre preparing for this show today, uh, I saw that it really wasn't quite as scripted as we might have thought. Now, maybe that's oh. untrue. But uh, it wasn't quite as scripted, that they were just kind of throwing stuff back and forth, and they had an idea of what they were going to talk about, certainly healthcare.gov. But I think it's also, in terms of political strategy, very much keeping with Obama's larger strategy of utilizing the media. And this was what was so effective for him when he originally ran for president. Yeah, so I exactly. think he's doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, I agree yeah. about that, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it's funny, though, that making fun of people is so funny. I mean, is that is that gendered humor? You know, like just saying, oh, hang over three, ha, ha, ha. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't think that was so funny, you know. Yeah, but part of the reality television and reality everything in the 21st century is all about making fun of right. people. And, and, it's a, it, and it's an evanescent thing. It's very rapid. It's like it, it appears and disappears very quickly. So it doesn't have the same content as like, say, writing a piece that appears in a newspaper that makes some sort of joke or like makes a joke at somebody's expense that when you're doing it in this context, that's the thing I think that Obama has had his finger on is the right moment just – almost as an evanescent thing that this will be gone in a week kind of thing, but it will have made an impression and yeah. that's it, yeah. it's passed on to the next thing. I think thing. that's right. I, I also, th I think Irene's dead on, even though gendered is one of my least favorite modern <laughs> neologisms. Uh, but I think you're right that it is gendered, but it's gendered for a reason too. You know, think about who he really needs right now. He needs young men. He needs young men a lot more than he needs young women because young men are the gold. They're that the, just sounds so wrong. <laughs> well, I know. I understand. <laughs> I probably should have put it a different way. He needs young men to sign up for health care. Okay, uh, they, they are the gold. They're the gold that's out there, you know, and, and they are – they're also sort of the donut hole in the current um, health care system, the, the sort of pre-Obamacare health care system. They tend not to have health insurance um, and, and they're a great bet for health insurance in, unfortunately – a way that young women aren't. Um, and so he, that's who he wants. He was absolutely trying to reach young men. He's trying to get, there's this March 31st deadline after which there's this tax penalty, which nobody's going to like very much. It's going to be, if a lot of people have to pay a tax penalty, the Obamacare will become unpopular in a whole new way. Uh, and uh, I think he was going after those young guys. Yeah. Can't they, just, can't they just put it forward a little and say, you know, we'll give you another two months just in case. I think they already, I mean, did, they already that. did that once, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. I guess men think it's – I mean, for him, I, I think it's funny. I actually think it was funny for Zach to, to make fun of the president because it's so it's so um, irreverent. And, you know, like, well, it's, you know, you're a nerd or whatever to call the president a nerd. That's kind of funny. But going in the other direction – but, yeah, I guess the young men like that. Well, this young is, men think it's you funny. You know, Gina Brecca has for many years kind of dined out on this point that, that men think it's really funny to go up to one another and say, <laughs> you know, where would you get that shirt? Did you have to dump the fertilizer out of the bag first or something? <laughs> Whereas, you know, if you 
If you said that to a woman, she'll burst out of tears. She'll be in the bathroom for exactly. You know. <laughs> uh, I mean, it really absolutely is, you know, sort of a difference in style. Let me just grab one quick call here. Our number, 860-275-7266. You dumped fertilizer over I, it? I just made that up on the, <laughs> the spot. 860-275. I may use it again, but I just made it up. Yeah, it's the art of insult. Right, 860-275-7266 yeah. is our number. Here's Annie on a cell phone. Hi, Annie. Hi, how are you? Just great. My comment is I, I really, I was so glad to see the president do something like this. Friends and I were talking the other day about how you're wondering, can the federal government hire a major ad agency or a major marketing firm to get this idea out there? Affordable health care is such a great idea. They've done a really poor job to date in really capturing some of the modern techniques of advertising and marketing and getting buzz out there in the community. So I applaud him for trying this technique. I think I think it can really work for him. And i I'd like to see more of it, to be honest with you. That, that, I'll take my uh, your response off there. All right. Um, I, I totally I, agree with her. Yeah, 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 I think she's absolutely right. No. I, Nah, I think she's wrong. I think if she got a modern, if they used a modern ad agency, they'd end up screwing it up, and it wouldn't be quite as irreverent and quite as spontaneous yeah. as it actually was. Well, don't don't you? I I'm not so sure that there weren't more like like that sort of professional involvement here too. I mean, one of the things about where Obama is now with this healthcare thing is that he has nothing to lose by loosening up a little and doing something like this. He's not going to be running for election again. It's a hugely important issue to him. It's his signature accomplishment in office, and so I'm sure that before this, that when when this was being discussed to do this. There was a discussion about how irreverent can you be, you know, like can yeah, you, yeah, can I you, agree. you know, well, go the, after. The guy who directed it, the guy who sort of product this really is, said we kept waiting for the White House to clamp down on us. We Because we, we were prepared for that too. Yeah. We kept waiting for them to say to us, okay, it's got to be about this. It can't be about this. He said it, it just never happened, yeah. you know, that, that, that they really trusted it. And just to Matt's point, I do think one of the things we're looking for here, and it'll, it'll come up again, I think, in the next conversation when we talk about the KISS video, you know, people are looking for authenticity or something that looks like authenticity. And the more layers of manipulation you put into something like that, I think the less likely it is to go viral. The more raw that it looks. And I mean, we understand, obviously, there's a certain amount of stagecraft in anything like this. But the more raw that it looks, I think the more likely it is to go viral. And, and the sense that maybe he is a little bit out on a tightrope here. He, this, you know, he is on a precipice. It's not perfectly scripted. It's a little bit improvised. He's not perfect at it. He's just okay at it, I think, is part of its appeal. Yeah, I think, I, I think, think the awkwardness, exactly, right. exactly, the awkwardness of the timing was exactly that. That that was something to me that I thought, oh, this was great, because the, even if there was a scripted component to it, it had a kind of spontaneity to it because of that, that edge, that little sort of timing error and sort of like, okay, so what's going to happen next? Yeah. I think they carried that really well, both of them. Yeah, I think there's also a little bit of a, a, almost a voyeurism quality to this <laughs> where where people are they feel like they're watching something that isn't so scripted and that you know it's kind of this weird sort of private thing in, in a way you know what i mean that's the yeah that's the value of awkwardness yeah. seeing somebody be awkward is is voyeuristic in a way yeah, yeah. the president yeah. anyway yeah um, there has been a little bit of a blowback to all this. We've got some interesting calls coming in. I'm going to get to them in just a second. Uh, a little bit of a blowback to this um, Although it's hard to say how much of a blowback, really. Uh, and this is something that Stephen Colbert, I think, put his <laughs> finger on perfectly yeah. in his response to this. Here's a little clip of uh, the Colbert show, the Colbert Report. Excuse me. This appearance set off a firestorm everywhere from Fox News to later in the day on Fox News. <laughs> How small is this? President Obama sitting down with comedian Zach Galifianakis for an online interview. Some would argue it's inappropriate. I think it's pretty tragic. Seemed uh, pretty whoever real. Whoever recommended that he do that show should be fired. This is way beneath the office of the presidency. President Obama hitting the comedy circuit. Is he getting the last laugh or making a mockery of the office? Zach Galifianakis is really funny. The problem is he won. Mm -hmm. He won that interview. President Obama, that was not a win for him. No. <laughs> She is, she is right. The very worst part about this disaster is that it worked. It's gotten over 13 million views, and what with everybody talking about it, it's boosted traffic to healthcare.gov by 40%. Well, that stops here. That stops here and now. They are not tricking me into talking about healthcare.gov and the President's Affordable Care Act. 
Jimmy, put the website on the screen so I know what I am not talking about, okay? You see that right there? Healthcare.gov. That is the last time that I ever say healthcare.gov. He kind of makes a nice point here, too, which is that the end game here is is a different one than some people seem to be pretending. The end game is exactly what he's talking about, getting the name of the website yeah. out, getting people to jump on it. And young people are never going to say, you know, that it's the perspective of the older person, people our age and over, um, who are going to say it's totally inappropriate, it's beneath his dignity. The young people like it. So yeah. Let me grab a call here from Jessica in Brantford. Hi, Jessica. Hi, how are you doing? Just great. Thanks for having me on. It's, just, it's great that you just played that clip because it is a perfect segue into what my comment was. Um, I'm a 27-year-old female, and I have a lot of male friends that are in my age group, and actually two of them sent me that video to watch, and I thought it was perfectly done. I mean, it was hilarious. It got the point across. But the even better than that, um, both of these young men who are perfectly healthy and otherwise did not have health care uh, signed up. So it's just wow. another example of it, of it working. Um, and I completely agree uh, that it is the older generation who it makes uncomfortable because it's different. And social media is something that's newer um, to the generation that is, you know, having a negative reaction to this. But I think it's working. You know, she makes a great point. And I think one of the interesting things about Fox News' reaction and a lot of other kinds of reactions of this type is um, it's not strictly political or ideological. They're also really, whether they know it or not, reacting to the fact that Obama went around conventional media uh, a little bit. I mean, Funny or Die, you know, is, is a little bit off the beaten track. And basically he said, look, I'm going to collaborate with somebody that, yeah, maybe 80 percent of the country has never heard of, but I need something to go viral uh, online. I'm going to do it. And I don't really need Fox News or CNN or MSNBC. In fact, that's explicitly who I don't need. And there's a little bit of a death rattle in some of the complaining that they're doing. Matt Warshower, one mm -hmm. thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, one of the things that was also in Colbert's rant, he played a clip of, uh, of Bill O'Reilly complaining about this and then saying that Lincoln would never have done such a thing. Uh, and of course, Colbert said, he's right. Lincoln never would have made a viral video. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as a Civil War scholar, I mean, you know, it kind of is a little bit like what Lincoln would have done or – except that Lincoln probably would have been Zach Galifianakis in the sense that he right. kind of liked coarse humor. Right? right. Well, exactly. Well, first, before I answer that, I, I got to say that if it was George W. Bush who did something like this, Fox News would say, oh, my God, how brilliant. Look, he is connecting with the youth <laughs> of America. I, so we yeah. all know about party spin. <laughs> But in terms of Lincoln, you're dead on. Lincoln had the most body sense of humor. He would have done it in a minute. Mm. He, he never had a problem going out in front of people and trying to speak to their language and to particular groups. He was really good at it. He would have done it in a heartbeat. And there's plenty of other presidents who would have done it too. I could see Teddy Roosevelt doing this. Mm. I, you know, it's... Yeah. And I, I think that's something that we've largely lost in the sort of, you know, in, in recent decades anyway, is the whole idea that there is this kind of um, majesty to the office. And so it's always a formal interview with the network anchors or it's somehow that that's the connection that the president should have with the people. But one of the things we really need now actually is to know the person and to get the person's – get a sense of the person. Barack Obama is a person who he, – he tends to look distant. He tends to seem distant at times. And in a situation like this where he's really making a connection that is that is completely different into a new media environment that doesn't seem to have all of those perquisites with it and the, the sense of the, you know, the, the weight of the office, he's just being an ordinary person, which to me, that's exactly what I want to know about him. What is he like as an ordinary person? How is he going to make decisions is not based on, you know, his polished performance in an interview with uh, a, a network anchor. It's going to be something that I see if how does he act in that particular whether it was scripted or not it, it's it, how is it that he appears what is that connection what makes me want to support something that he's for or something that he says it also cuts through all the all the propaganda on the other side about Ob Obamacare too you know why yes, is Obamacare yeah. so horrible it doesn't make any sense that they think it's so horrible because it really is in right. people's interest to get it right so he's sort of cutting through all that as well yes I think also there's there's a history of this kind of thing and I 
I, I could, if I had, give me an hour and I could really sketch it out. But that, that, first of all, what's happening on this Funny or Die Between Two Ferns interview is it's kind of a spoof of community television, community access television, <laughs> uh, of sort of yeah. amateurishly badly worded questions. And, and there is somebody called in about Andy Kaufman interviews, even interviewing President Reagan. You know, there is uh, the early days of the Ali G show. People of considerable eminence oh, yeah. would come on the show not understanding even, <laughs> you know, who he was and, and these explosive Yeah, things. his was much more of a spoofing. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, the interview was not in on the joke. But we, we like this because we understand that the conventional means of extracting information, Bob Schieffer or George Stephanopoulos or Tim Russert, the late Tim Russert, or somebody like that, asking very clubby questions that are very Beltway-based in which everybody is pretty much from the same animal species, right? They're all from the Beltway. Some of them are politicians. Some of them are journalists. But this isn't really something that's likely to pry the kind of unscripted human moment that James is talking about out of another person. But then I think for that reason, there's a tremendous market for this kind of thing, yeah. even, even if it's a little bit managed. Yeah, it's connecting with people who are, are – I mean my students who are in that 20-something range are completely tuned out on major media networks. They mm-hmm. watch Jon Stewart. They, this is their thing. Yeah. And I just have to say, you mentioned Ali G. And the thing that popped into my mind is when he interviewed Buzz Aldrin. And he introduces him and says, yeah, I'm sitting here with my main man, Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the early Ali G th- interviews oh, where, people, where people did not understand what was happening were a fabulous thing in and of themselves. I think we're going to take a quick break here. We'll come back. We'll see how much other ground we can cover. There is a whole other video that we need to talk about, the one that got three times as many views as President Obama. Oh, we're back. We have so many things to talk about off the air, too. Uh, with me, uh, Matt Warshower and James Hanley and Irene Papoulos. This is The Nose. We welcome your phone calls. We're switching gears a little bit, but not much. We're going to talk about a different video here in this segment. Uh, the number, by the way, if you get interested, 860-275-7266. So roughly 30, 13 million people uh, watched President Obama and uh, Zach Galifianakis on uh, Between Two Ferns. 42 million, I think, the last time I heard, uh, watched the short video First Kiss. Uh, This is a video in which 20 strangers uh, were asked to convene in a blank room and pair up with one another uh, and kiss for the first time in front of the camera. It's um, interestingly edited. It's paired up with with a kind of haunting uh, piece of music. Um, And for some reason or other, it really has mesmerized people. It exists for a purpose. It's not a piece of pure art, and we'll get to that in just a second. But, um, But Irene... Take it away. Um, well, that's the mystery. Why is that so attractive? So, you know, there's so many other – There's, I feel like there's people doing videos like that all over that only get like 10 views. Mm-hmm. And why is it – with you know, part of it is so they're so beautiful, the people in the video. It's in black and white, which is kind of intriguing. And um, there's that awkwardness of sort of imagining kissing someone that you've never seen before. Or I don't know how they paired them up. Did they get to have any choice on who they got paired with, I wonder? Well, yeah. this is a little bit like Funny or Die. We don't exactly know every single piece of manipulation that was done. We, we now do know, of course, these people were not just pulled off the street. Uh, and for the most part, they are not just anybody. Uh, many of them are people who are models or have some acting background. And, but not all of them. Some of them – one of them was a writer. And writers never get to kiss anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they know them really well. Um, so, but, um, uh, you know, so I thought there was also that there was that element of awkwardness, which was the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. that we were saying that's kind of interesting to see how awkward people are when they're faced with that. But then it all it all works out really beautifully. But I actually it's a mystery to me why it was so popular. Did you like it? Um, I it sort of something something seemed wrong to me about it, but I can't really put my finger on exactly what it was. The unknownness of of it, and I was thinking, you know, am I getting old? You know, like when I was in my twenties, would I have thought that was really much more intriguing than I do now? Like the thought of kissing someone that you don't know at all and you haven't chosen, someone has just put you together with, and now you have to kiss them. That kind of, in some way, gives me the creeps. 
who wants to take it next? I, I think it's kind of interesting that, that to me, like the first thought was I thought, you know, what could be possibly wrong with, you know, like people kissing and like, you know, video of people kissing and that, that's great, you know. But at the same time, um, it, it, you know, we were talking about awkwardness. The, 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 the awkwardness in the, um, in the Obama uh, video was like it played well to me and had a kind of authenticity to it. In this, the awkwardness seems to be, I, I don't know, I kept on thinking of somebody who's like selected these people did, and, and thinking of what did they want to convey, you know, and it had a kind of polish to it that didn't have spontaneity to me. I think that's what made me feel, okay, so, uh, but then you think again, well, given what the vast majority of videos that are popular online that they're not going to catch your attention in the same way. This had a kind of artifice to it that was kind of interesting to watch, but I don't have any illusions about it really being sort of either spontaneous or really sort of as simple as it seemed. It seemed to me that there was a lot of com complex calculation going See, on there. See, my, my reaction was completely different to it. I, I hadn't read anything about it at all. I just, used, you know, Colin sent me the link. I clicked on the link, and I had been, I, I watched, you know, the series of things that we we're talking about today. So I clicked on one link, then another link, then another link. <laughs> I got to that one and I was actually kind of touched by it. And I thought it was beautiful and I did think it was spontaneous. And they are either outstanding actors and actresses to create that sense of awkwardness or there was real awkwardness and spontaneity. And again, I think it's popular because there's that voyeuristic aspect. Yeah. And yeah. they seem to like each other, too. I mean, there was a lot of chemistry in the pairs. Yeah. Which was, would that really be the case if the people were randomly paired up? I don't know, but I got excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do think, you know, we used the term voyeurism just a few minutes ago talking about the Funny or Die video. For me, this had very real voyeuristic appeal. Uh, and I actually did. I found it. <laughs> I don't know what it says about me, but I, I was kind of mesmerized by it. I watched it twice. Yeah, that's what um, I felt. Yeah, and, and I, I wanted to sort of look at all these different pairings, these different interactions, and try to understand what was happening there. Because I, I think, first of all, I mean, over the course of a lifetime, you know, all of us kiss various people. Uh, but you really don't, I, I, don't, I haven't really sort of seen it pinned down like a butterfly on a board the way it is here. And, and so I think that makes it interesting. And I, well, I would agree what with What was that. pinned down? Though. Well, that idea anyway that, okay, we're going to watch this interaction, that interaction, that interaction, and see how this kiss goes. Now, it's all heavily edited. You wouldn't yeah, want to yeah, watch. Absolutely. Yeah, you wouldn't even want to watch, you know, the four-minute I would. You would, all right. I would prefer You'd to rather watch, watch it. Yeah, I would, yeah, actually, I rather. agree with that. I'd like to see the outtakes. You want the raw footage. <laughs> yes. I would now like <laughs> to advocate that we do this experiment. <laughs> and the next time you do the show in downtown Hartford and yeah. one of your pop-out studios, I... I think we should do an experiment. Well, it's audio. We'll just ha all we have to do is make kissing noises. And it'll, <laughs> it'll be theater of the you mind. Pre-record the kissing noises. Okay, but, I forgot we were on radio. Yeah, but I, I think also that it goes back also to the, the word we used again vis-a-vis uh, -vis Obama and Galifianakis, and that is authenticity. That that I I agree with Matt. Somehow or other, I thought a lot of them made this seem pretty authentic. Like they were authentically uncomfortable and awkward uh, at the beginning. Uh, and, and some of them, I think, stayed uh, awkward. There, there was actually one couple where the woman was almost craning her head into a J shape to kind of get yeah. back. She yeah. was trying to get back from the guy. I identified with her. Yeah. <laughs> I thought a few of them were going to drop on the floor. Yeah, and then All there right. were a few of them yeah. who really, really got into it. Now, whether yeah. they got into it as actors or, or not, I, I don't know. Now, it has been suggested by one of our favorite writers, Amanda Hess and Slate, that once you realize that this is all basically an extended 42 million times viewed commercial or, or something, oh, a viral video commercial. You know, on, be on behalf of a clothing line called Wren, which is lo uh, rolling out their 2014 fall line. I don't know how many of the people kissing are actually wearing Wren clothing that are part of the 24 – that's part of the 2014 uh, fall line. This, for some people – takes a little bit of the bloom off the rose. I don't know. Did it do that to you? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. Because then it's not really – then you feel more like they're – I agree that they would have to be incredible actors to have faked the awkwardness. So, yeah, I mean, I guess – but if it's all in the name of selling clothes, let's get people to kiss each other. I don't well, know. I, I don't know. It must be just me, but I, 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 anything that I see online like that, I sort of immediately sort of like – I guess it's that – that underlying suspicion maybe that I'm just a sus suspicious person that we, I'm, I'm wondering where this is coming from, you know, what it's about. And actually, I kind of congratulate the small 
company that actually got this together as an advertising campaign because I, I'm, if they really are, if Wren is indeed a very small company as they seem to be and they, they don't get much coverage, the fact that they could suddenly explode in awareness publicly with their, with, with their uh, clothing line or whatever, I'd say good luck to them because we're constantly being subverted by campaigns that are supposedly like viral and supposedly like secret but actually turn out to be you know Colgate Palmolive or something like that 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 <laughs> here you know you've got something that is actually a small company so I get say good luck to them for that but all of these things all of these things are creations that really they kind of lack spontaneity that's the problem for me I'm actually planning on going out after the show to uh, rechange my entire wardrobe to, <laughs> to rent jeans. Um, you know what? That's the thing about the advertising and why I, I fail to understand advertising because this does not make me interested in Ren jeans. It doesn't make me want to go out and buy Ren jeans. It's, it, it's advertising disconnect to me. But what they're doing, though, is that everybody's saying that word, Wren. Yeah. So when people walk down the street and they now see the name, then that's what advertising is all about, is that recognition. Right. And they've gotten the name out, and it's being millions and millions of times repeated. Yeah, yeah. So in that sense, they've succeeded. But uh, if you're if you're you know picking particular types of clothing, it's sort of like you have to have this scatter shot that picks up everybody, but then the people who would actually select that clothing – the word is in the is in the air. Yeah. Somebody somewhere this week bought a pair of Ren jeans and signed up for healthcare.gov. Um, <laughs> that person was really successfully marketed to, uh, and his or her consciousness. Hey, was maybe raised. they should give out a pair of Ren jeans if they sign up for healthcare.gov. <coughs> there we are. Yes, <laughs> at least sell ads on yeah. the site. No, what they that, that that's the thing. You know, if the spe people at healthcare.gov are smart, they'll put a link on that site. They'll buy a link on that site. <laughs> <laughs> and also, there'll be somebody kissing Joe Biden. Uh, oh, you had to ruin the moment, right, didn't you? We did. <laughs> All right. So just moving on here very quickly, and I think I might be able to cover two cop topics pretty quickly here. I mean, we can't go into great depth for e to e either one of them, but um, one of them is so much up James's alley that uh, I really want to spend at least a few seconds on it. And that is, and, and you know, we talk about culture on the show as opposed to hard news most of the time. The disappearance of the Malaysian plane is hard news, and it's a serious story. But Beyond that serious story has been this – it has opened up an almost unprecedented world of speculation about what's really happening here. Um, in fact, almost the one thing that nobody believes is whatever the official account right now is in terms of what is actually known and what is actually suspected. And it's compounded by the fact that many people who are in official capacities are now offering up bizarre conspiracy theories uh, of their own. And I know that, James, you feel as though increasingly we, we live in a world in which we're all conspiracy theorists because we have to be. Well, that's it. I mean, you've got to be, as uh, I think, a connoisseur of, of, of conspiracies in that you can filter out some of the stuff. But one of the fascinating backgrounds to this particular uh, situation is that I think a vast segment of the world population has gotten the idea that everything is tracked now and uh, that your phone is tracked, wherever you are, you're tracked. And it's certainly true that the entire planet is observed by satellites that can resolve down to about a foot. And so these there are pictures being taken 24-7 of the entire planet. And it's very hard to imagine that a thing as big as a, as a, as a, as a giant jet can actually get lost. Um, but there's, but because people have this feeling that everything is being tracked and therefore it's a kind of reassurance that you could always find out what went wrong, you can always go back and play the tape, find out, okay, then, then this was who did it, this was what was wrong. But we're being presented here with something that is entirely different that immediately plays into the idea that there must be people with agendas who don't want certain things to come out. And so it's an incredibly, increasingly fertile ground for conspiracy. Plus, you have the tools with the Internet to spread conspiracy. And it's interesting for a lot of people find it fascinating to follow conspiracies and think about conspiracies. And they get more and more outlandish. I mean, if you, uh, Colin, you sent around that link for, you know, just, just thinking about, uh, you know, the top five conspiracy theories, which everything from aliens and, and so on. It, it It's really a fertile ground for that. But one of the things that is toxic about it, I think, is that it erodes that sense of, you know, actually feeling that there's a possibility of getting truth about something. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes me think about silence in general, you know, like the, in a way the thing, the reason if we had found out, seen the debris, we would have forgotten about it. But it's there's something about silence that's really 
uh, intriguing, you know, and I and I say that as somebody who used to be really shy and, you know, I, there were so many guys interested in me because I didn't talk. You know, I felt like, wow, silence is so powerful. I, I have to Mis- learn how to misty, manipulate Misty, mystery. This. Yes, exactly. You know, there's yeah. something about not talking yeah. that drives people crazy and they want to know, they want to find out more. They want to, you know, tell me, tell me something, tell me something, you know, and that's what a lot of religion is based on. Things we don't, you know, it's, it's sort of silent. God is kind of silent, you know, whatever, however you would define that. So there's something fascinating and we want it we want to know we want to hold on to it and if we don't if we don't get any information that makes us all the more excited in a way i think at least yeah. as far at least for for a certain amount of time or there's there's enough mystery that we feel like what really you know we want to we want to answer those questions because yeah, we of don't that. like not knowing yeah yeah oh, and but matt you know history is uh, is also just a chain of counter narratives. I mean, you think about Hofstadter's paranoid style in American oh, yeah. politics, where you know some of the conspiracies that are laid out there from various historical periods sound like, with a minimal amount of updating, they could be today's conspiracies. I, I think, to me, the difference now is because of digital life. Uh, a phenomenon that has always existed, this kind of paranoid sense that we're not being told the truth, uh, that, there are in, in, th- that there are other things going on, uh, and, and that there are powerful people scheming for their own benefit or for added control over us in the background. That's just been sort of bombed by digital life. So it, it just becomes a much, much, much bigger and more heavily reticulated thing. Yeah, I think uh, the people have always been bombed by this. I think a lot of what we're talking about now has – always existed. We're just talking about a different platform and a different uh, extension of range uh, involved in it. And so I I think you hit it on the head. And, you know, my response to when you sent this out, uh, I, I, if you remember, I emailed you back and I said, I happen to know what happened. Uh, (laughs) Amelia Earhart is responsible (laughs) for this. And I know this for a fact because I heard it on Fox News. The, although, James, there is, you know, to your point, an interesting layering of this, which is that our ordinary conspiracy is that the government or somebody, capital S, knows everything. Um, and, and now we're troubled because they're not delivering on that essentially paranoid promise. Uh, right, exactly. It gets, it's, it's sort of like you had a, a show this week was fascinating on folding. It's like, it's like that sort of folding effect that you have these expectations and the expectations are not fulfilled. So another facet gets, uh, gets opened up. And one of the big facets here about potential conspiracies theories and so on is insecurity, is the sense that you uh, there is an expectation now that we should know things. But the question is, who do you know things from? If you go onto the internet and look up things, you are assuming, okay, like go to Wikipedia, for example, and uh, uh, you might possibly get some theories about this flight that's missing, but you don't know for sure what is the evidence, where is this coming from. And the institutions that we might think would be respectable on that, like particular news sources or governments or people who work for us, ostensibly work for us, would provide us with that information and don't. And so it expands to this universe of conspiracy and distrust, which is actually it, – it, it's focused on everything that happens um, that is unpredictable. It can be a terrorist attack. It can be a lost plane. It can be some political event. I mean how many people, for example, go beyond the idea of the uh, confrontation between East and West that's represented in Crimea but who don't know any of the history of it and what that represents? Uh, it, it's an incredibly complex thing that is – we're encouraged now to look at these things very simply and to see the plane missing as the big mystery. But there's much more to it. There's much more going on. Uh, that, okay. Yeah, so it's interesting to think about w- w- what's more, what's more uh, intriguing, the fact that somebody – that we have no idea and there's all these – you know, we just have no idea what happened to the plane or the idea that somebody knows but isn't telling us. I yes, guess it has exactly. to be the latter. And yeah. the insecurity that that implies. But I think it also is the most basic human nature sort of a thing of – the not knowing factor. Uh, mm-hmm. Think about people who uh, have had series of, of medical problems and they, you know, they, they keep going to different doctors and they can't get the diagnosis mm-hmm. and they finally get the diagnosis and they go, oh, finally, at least I know. I, I'm very, very sick, but at least now I know. And so there is that the, the, people don't 
like not knowing. They f- it makes yeah. them feel out of control. Right. We don't exactly. like it, but we're fascinated by it, too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's the old joke, you're not paranoid if everybody's really out to get you. And, and I, <laughs> I do feel as though, you know, part of the paranoia is stems from what we've been through with the Edward Snowden revelations. Um, and, and, and even, you know, like every day in the news, I mean, I'm most of us here are old enough to remember that the 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 Senate Intelligence Oversight Committee was established basically to watch over intelligence activities and to have access, classified access to all that information so that our intelligence apparatus couldn't get out of control again. And so it's kind of astonishing to watch them right now having a fight that, that really started over the fact that they can't get certain exactly, things. Exactly, exactly yeah. right. They're supposed yeah. to be able to yeah. get everything. <laughs> right. I mean, it's since gone on to other kinds of iterations. One, one side spying on the other, then that side spies back. But it all started with the fact that this oversight committee can't get the documents to do oversight, which I thought was the fundamental promise of the existence of this committee in the first place. Don't you love yeah. irony? <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I, so anyway, I, I think that sort of feeds a little bit of it. I think what we've we got to do is go to break here. If we have well, yeah, what we'll do as we head into the break, uh, I don't know if we'll have time to discuss it on the other side because we want to do endorsements. But, you know, one of the interesting little linguistic things that came up this week was uh, uh, Sheryl Sandberg, one of sort of the leading spokespersons for kind of a new style of feminism, uh, starting a site uh, arguing for a ban insofar it is a, as it is possible, a ban on the word bossy. So uh, let's hear a little bit of the video uh, anyway that's up on that site, one of several videos. This video, by the way, has all kinds of interesting people like Beyonce and uh, and Jane Lynch and Condoleezza Rice. Those are some of the voices uh, that you may be hearing on this video as they talk about banning the word bossy. And we'll just go into a break from there. Pushy. Stubborn. Stubborn. Pushy. 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 Stubborn. Stubborn. Bossy. 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 When I was growing up, I was called bossy. I think the word bossy is just a squasher. Being labeled something matters. By middle school, girls are less interested in leadership than boys. And that's because they worry about being called bossy. We need to tell them it's okay to be ambitious. We need to help them lean in. Words matter. Let's just ban the word bossy. the word bossy is banned, does that mean we have to rename the WNPR cow? Get along now, leaning in. That just doesn't sound right. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our interns are Jane Ashley and Skylar Magnoli. The part of Bill Curry was played by Ed Helms. Greg Hill appeared in our intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. Katie Talarski is our executive producer. For show pages, articles, and a beautiful video of the Faith Middleton Show staff kissing strangers and then apologizing for not warning them first, visit WNPR.org. On Monday, The Scramble tackles the news of the weekend. And now, back to Colin. Yeah, we probably have uh, a few seconds to uh, talk about bossy before we go to endorsements. So, Irene Papoulis, uh, <laughs> I promise to stop saying bossy if you promise to stop saying gendered. How's that? <laughs> Never. No, I don't like I don't like banning words, but I think uh, being I've been called bossy many times as the oldest of five and as an English teacher, and um, I think the discussion about banning it is great. Yeah, the discussion is probably good. James? Yeah, yeah I would agree. I think you can always talk about the words, and, and raising consciousness about how you use words is huge. But uh, banning it, uh, it just sounds plain silly um, to say, uh, to ban it. But have the discussion about it. Yes, that's a great idea. Matt? Irene, I don't think you're bossy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, I, I, same thing. I I think it's always interesting to talk about the concepts of words and how they (laughs) reflect in a culture. And, but, you know, if it's not this word, it's going to be another word. It's, I mean, I had, I had, there's other B words. Yeah. Yeah. I had not even really thought until they brought it up about the word bossy being, God for God help me, gendered. Oh, uh, I, yeah, I felt exactly the same word. I, I had the same reaction. Yeah, mm-hmm. but, but they're right. I mean, yeah, once, right. I, once I thought about it, they're right. That's, that's who gets called bossy. I just, it never occurred to me that that was a word that had some kind of... Um, I think creating the educational environment where uh, you, you kids are really having the discussion about figuring out what people mean by the words they use. Because what would you call you know, a, bo- a boy that had the, or a man who had the same quality? Manly. <laughs> well, no, it goes the other way. It's like, <laughs> like uh, yeah, you can't be a wimp. You can't be a wussy. You can't be a wimp or a pansy. Yeah, but I think that part of this, as I think many things in life, do come down to some extent to, to parenting. Uh, and, you know, if somebody was – I have three daughters. If somebody were to describe my daughters as bossy, 
I would – that's a conversation that I would have with them and talk about the attributes of how that can be at times a positive thing, not just a negative sure. thing. Yeah. It means yeah. that you know, you're, you're willing to stand up for yourself. You're willing to take charge. And I will go on record. I will pay for this. But my middle daughter is bossy. All right. Uh-huh. <laughs> on, on that stirring note, it's time for endorsements. Uh, Irene, go ahead. Um, I, um, there's a, there's a, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, uh, there's this book called The Land of Steady Habits by someone named Ted Thompson that I heard about because I, I agreed to moderate a conversation with him at the Mark Twain House on, uh, April 7th, a uh, second, and it's a really, it's a really good book. It's coming out next week, and it's about Connecticut. It's a good book club book. It's about a marriage, disintegrating marriage, and, um, so it's, very, a no- it's, very, a it's a novel, yeah, yeah intriguable. The, na- the Land of Steady ha- Habits by Ted Thompson. I had read Tolkien's The Land of Steady Hobbits, but uh, that's different. <laughs> oh, right. that was bad. Go ahead, James. Um, there's a last chance to see inside Lewin Davis at Cine Studio, the Coen Brothers film, which I really love. Mm-hmm. Uh, great performances and uh, really good film. And also, actually, I just heard today a repeat of an interview with a wonderful writer for a book I plugged before, I think, called Gulp, Mary Roach, mm-hmm. who writes about the elementary canal in human beings. Absolutely amazing book. Definitely recommended. Matt? Well, if I may, two quick endorsements. Yeah. One, uh, people have to come to Central Connecticut State University on March 29th and see uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and historian Tony Horwitz come to discuss his books. That's going to be fantastic. And, what time? And, and uh, It is an all-day uh, conference. And so we're going to have a variety of different things going on. Very, very easy to find. If you just you know, Googled CCSU and Tony Horowitz or CCSU and Civil War. It, it's going to be a fascinating conversation. And one of Tony Horowitz's books is about Civil War reenactors. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's, Confederates it's, uh, in the Attic. It's, yeah. it's fantastic. But uh, second is a result of preparing for this show. Uh, doc, doc, <laughs> Dr. Stephen, what is it, Blinky? Brule. Brule, Brule, thank you. Dr. B-R-U-L-E. Stephen Brule. And this is uh, the, the actor Kevin Riley who played in Talladega Nights and in uh, Step Brothers. And I'd never heard of it. You you sent me a couple of links to it, and I was practically I fell out of my chair laughing. It was so funny. I mean, this this goes back to I mean, one of the reasons I sent this around is I think for a lot of people. I mean, I was driving back from our New Britain appearance with one of our interns, uh, Greg Anthony, uh, and when this whole thing came on about two ferns, and I sort of kind of almost had a vague idea of what that was. I certainly know who Zach Galifianakis is, but he knew all about it. He, I, he Right away, he said, oh, really? Obama went on that? That's amazing. That's, you know, and, and similarly, as we were talking about that style of humor and, and about the way that uh, and, and certain shows kind of invoke the crude production styles of community access, um, various people out of the newsroom, Tucker Ives, Heather Brandon, said, well, yes, yeah, like Dr. Steve Brule. And once again, I, I used to be a very plugged-in person who knew about all kinds of really cool and unusual things. I drew a complete blank on this, and so we got that, and we we sent that around. And, it was hilarious. Yeah, Absolutely I mean, hilarious. Um, you'll either find it hilarious or you won't. I think this also might be gender. <laughs> yeah. Little, it might be a <laughs> yeah. little gender. I have to agree. All right. So a couple of quick things here. Um, this I'm going to sort of violate my rule and really plug something. Um, first of all, I would like to endorse the idea of seeing Lewin, Lewin Davis a second time. If I can squeeze that in this weekend, I'll do that. I felt the first time I saw this movie that I needed to see it again because I came in with a whole bunch of expectations based on Coen Brothers movies, and it really wasn't like any of those movies. And as a result, I was kind of struggling with that the whole time. Uh, I need to see it with a cleaner slate. So uh, I do endorse that idea. Um, on April 9th, which is a Wednesday, uh, some of you have been to the shows that we've done at Watkinson School. It's part of a series I've started over there called Freshly Squeezed. We're doing a show called uh, a show in a, in a forum called How Do We Get Back to the Field of Dreams? It's, it's about Uh, The signals that are sent from the very top of the sports pyramid right down to the playing fields and and courts uh, that our kids use. And and it's it's kind of about the ways in which sports have lost their innocence and the way competing is a more common phenomenon than playing uh, and all the sort of injuries and doping and other consequences that go along with it. We have a really terrific panel. I won't name them all now because uh, we'll uh, run out of time, uh, but they're terrific. It's uh, a very inexpensive ticket to go at Watkinson.org. It supports nonprofits out in the community, so we really do encourage you to show up. Uh, you'll also be part of the radio show that we do there that night. So come to Watkinson School at 7 p.m. April 9th. Circle the date right now, and then we'll talk more about this. I, I hear Grace and Hugh singing in the background, so I'm going to say Goodbye. Thank you, Matt Warshower, James Hanley, Irene Papoulis. We'll be back on Monday with The Scramble.
I'm Kyone Wolf, and I'd like to welcome President Barack Obama. Thank you for coming in, sir. Good to be with you. Well, we just wrapped up an episode of The Nose. What did you think? Now, I have to say that I've seen this show before, and some of the episodes have probably been a little bit better than this. Okay. Thank you for coming on, Mr. President.